Welcome to today's session, <laughs> The Art of Being a River Guide. I'm your moderator, Angie Furman, and I'm going to be guiding uh, us through today's discussion. So being a river ranger is no ordinary job, right? It requires a unique set of skills, a passion for the outdoors, and the ability to handle various responsibilities simultaneously, often with limited resources. Today, we've gathered a group of presenters, panelists, who are going to be sharing their knowledge and experience and shedding some light on the strategies used by river rangers across the country. So I'd like to introduce our four panelists. Um, today, joining us, we've got Tony Mancuso. He's worked on the Colorado or works with the Colorado and Green River Management Division of Forestry, Fire and State Lands with the Utah Department of Natural Resources. And Tony brings a wealth of experience in rivers and is gonna share some insights on smoother public, public interactions among some other topics. Today joining us, we also have Patrick Collage, the <laughs> commercial <laughs> permit administrator from the Medford District of the Grants Pass Field Office of the Bureau of Land Management. So Patrick's extensive experience is also going to how to help us find ways to juggle multiple duties. Also joining us today, we've got Echo Miller Barnes, the lead river ranger from the Hungry Horse Glacier View Ranger District of the Flathead National Forest. Echo's got some expertise in working with stake other stakeholders to maximize the impact of your work as a river ranger. And then last but not least today, we've also got Chad Niehaus, who's the San Juan River Ranger from the Monticello Field Office of the Bureau of Land Management. And Chad is going to share some expertise in streamlining the river check-in process to help us uh, have a good understanding of the crucial role that that plays and how it can help save time and minimize errors. So throughout today's session, our presenters are going to share some tips and tricks and best practices to help you save some time and accomplish more in the field. And so we're gonna um, go through a, a list of some questions that we've already pre-formulated, but we're also gonna have time for some Q&A throughout the session and at the end. So if you have any questions, uh, feel free to put them into the chat or when the time comes, you'll be able to unmute and ask them. So I'm gonna stop sharing my screen now so that we can all have a conversation. And uh, without further ado, uh, let's go ahead and kick things off. So um, my first question is for, let's start with Tony. And Tony, can you describe a situation where you've had to juggle multiple duties as a river ranger? And maybe share with us how you prioritize your tasks and manage your time efficiently? Um, Working at the Utah DNR in the navigable waterways section is kind of unique because rather than uh, a river ranger program being a part of a, a recreation section or a specific national conservation area, um, everything that goes and happens down in the river corridor in the navigable waterway um, comes through our office. So from recreation to real key to grazing, um, rights of way, finance, we kind of handle everything that happens in this little sliver of land that usually has BLM or Park Service on either side of it. And so we have to do a lot of triage um, and a lot of times triage between programs. Like, well, you know, this week, the recreation stuff has got to take a little bit of priority over easements and rights of way. And uh, maybe commercial permits are going to have to be delayed for a week because this major legal thing came up with a boundary center or something. Like that. Um, and what I really work hard on uh, and, and with my people is um, not waiting around to get someone else to organize us for our phone. Um, the first thing we do is take extra time to make sure we're all on the same page about what's going to be the plan for the week. Um, I come up with my own standard procedures and best practices that work for my program. And if 
division or state come down and say, actually, you know, we'd rather have it look a different way. That's fine. That's their prerogative. But I'm not just going to wait for someone else to organize my job for me. And so I'm making lists at the end of every day and at the end of every week. But what I plan to do in the next week, I'm sharing that with leadership so they know what I'm up to. And um, I, someone told me once that the only thing worse than wasting time intentionally was wasting time unintentionally. So I'm not just you know sitting around waiting to get told what to do. Um, that's, that's my big thing. When you have all this stuff going on, um, don't procrastinate, get out in front of it. Same question to echo about, you know, juggling multiple duties and prioritizing tasks. I know it might be a little different um, where you work. Yeah, um, I think this question made me laugh because I could. There's a never ending amount of times when I'm not juggling multiple duties. I think it would be easier to say, when am I not juggling multiple duties? Um, but my, that sort of looks a little different for me than Tony. Um, like you said, I am in charge of our <laughs> field operations for um, our river crew up here on the flathead. Um, and so juggling multiple duties looks more like um, figuring out, you know, not only planning for the week, um, planning where we're going to patrol who's going to go where, um, but also balancing asks from um, maybe other programs of, hey, do you have the opportunity or, you know, do you have the time to take our wildlife biologists down the river so then they can look at loon habitat? Um, or can you take, um, you know, this visiting group down the river this week because um, we want to get them out onto the river? Um, and then in addition to the river stuff, doing, you know, access site maintenance, um, individual responsibilities that come up for myself that aren't um, like crew attached, that don't require everybody, um, but that I've got to take care of. Um, and I think the biggest things that help me kind of balance that and manage what's, um, what do I spend my time on or um, all of that is kind of going through a checklist and asking myself, like, is it time sensitive or like an actually urgent matter? Um, is there anybody else who can cover this? Like, do I need to be the person who needs to go look at this one camp or needs to answer this question? Or can I send one of my other um, rangers or crew members out? Or can I bounce it over to, you know, another coworker? Um, another big question I always ask myself is, do we have the capacity to do this? Um, not only like, do we have the gear? Do we have the time? Do we have the personnel to make it happen? Um, or are we already booked with some other things? And then I'm, uh, you know, it's really hard to say no because you want to get like as much as you can done in the field season. Um, but being okay with saying no and providing alternatives to, you know, whatever ask if it's possible and saying, Hey, we can't do it this week. Um, but you know, next week we actually have an opening and it would work a lot better. Like, does that work for you? So yeah, those are those are the questions I ask myself. Um, your perspective on this, I know also different from Tony with the state and then Echo with the Forest Service or with the BLM. I don't know if you have any, and also just through your experience. Oh yeah, no, it's it's you're always juggling multiple multiple duties. As the uh, I'm the crew lead on the Rogue, um, I'm not I'm no longer the permit administrator. I was permit administrator for three of the night uh, for three of the 22 years I've worked for the BLM, but the other 19 I've been a, a river ranger. And um, as that, uh, I mean, it's uh, the main thing to get you on course when you're juggling multiple duties is just think of the priorities in order. Number one being safety and then serving the resource, um, gathering data, being the eyes and ears of the agency, and um, then sometimes having to be uh, the VIP uh, trip leader. All these things can be happening simultaneously. I can have a group of river rangers going out with herpetologists to do turtles and then simultaneously 
taking out our our PIO and our district manager and trying to keep all those things juggled and occasionally getting on the water myself. Um, it's amazing how uh, how many times you're shifting hats. And uh, I, I like what Tony said, it's crucial to be able to get in front of these problems as opposed to waiting for them to uh, collapse on your head. And that can only be done with planning and, and list making and good relationships with all the people in your office, your uh, your lead um, rec planner who's in charge of the of, of the of the resource and your managers, and then all of the other uh, ologists that we that we uh, we facilitate as the eyes and ears of the river program. Uh, the rogue has got a pretty robust uh, river program and a, a long history, and that makes it an interesting place. Um, interesting place to work. I also worked on the Sean Day in the, in the Deschutes for 15 years. So I've got two different district offices that I can see similarities and differences. And um, it's uh, one time a river guide asked me why there are so many regulations for all the rivers when they're all just bodies of water that start high and end up low. And it just basically comes down to the politics and the people that are in the watersheds that have created these different plans. Um, so it's been fascinating working in other in other districts. I don't know, I've gotten way off 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 topic. I'm sorry. Rick. So my next question is for Chad. Um, how do you handle difficult visitors or situations in a way that is professional and constructive? Or have you found strategies uh, that are effective in diffusing tense situations? Yeah. So the main thing that I try to go to at the start is to use humor um, and kindness um, and just kind of try to connect with the person that's in a tough spot. I mean, this is kind of a general, um, you know, I'm thinking of certain situations with this question, but uh, obviously this is kind of a broad one. Um, the main thing I do is listen. So I just kind of give the person, uh, you know, an opportunity to kind of tell me what's going on. And, and sometimes that even just that act right there kind of helps resolve things a bit. Um, I definitely, whatever's happening, I try to focus on the path forward rather than just kind of stewing on the past, even if the past was five minutes ago, um, uh, definitely an opportunity to kind of listen and a chance to kind of just process, but then like, let's focus on how we're going to resolve this issue and kind of move ahead, um, in a way that feels good to everybody. Um, and then I'm also honest. So if somebody's asking me, you know, something can happen and it can't, I just tell them straight away. Um, but I try to do it in, 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 again, in a kind way. Um, I don't know what I do when I find kind of tense situations in life and on work is just like I take a deep breath. And it seems like sometimes when I do that, that kind of spreads. It's a little catchy. And so just to and also maybe say something a little out of context or um, just to kind of shift people's mindset a little bit and uh, remember a little bit of perspective and context. Um, and that seems to help a lot. Um, that's a trick I also use with my 14 year old son. It seems to work quite effectively on the river running public as well. And thing to keep in mind. Um, Patrick, what about you? I'm curious if you have uh, any strategies that are effective for diffusing tense situations or handling vis uh, difficult visitors. Yeah, that's something that um, kind of comes to you either early and you ride it for the rest of your career or you don't like it and you do something else with your life because it's part of the, we're the pointy edge of the spear when it comes to public contact. For a lot of people, they're on the river. It might be their only interaction with with an agency, and they may have a lot to say about the agency, and they might be saying it to you in a way that you might interpret as as rude. Um, so, what I try to do is remember they're they're talking to, you know, they're talking to the badge, and they're not talking to me personally. I listen to them if somebody is really hot, and uh, let them totally vent, nod my head, tell them that I'll get the answers they're looking for, follow up with contact information if they're willing to provide that. And, um, but that is, I'm sure most of you can attest that's very rare. Most people on the river are got a grin ear to ear and, and they're just happy to be there. So most of the confrontations that I see in, in my current river and actually my last couple are just competition for campsites where we're kind of called on to be a referee and try to listen to both sides and try to make a decision that actually even the one that's not all that happy with it is generally happy that things have been de-escalated and this, the referee has shown up and, and separated things and, and, and made things better. 
Um, but yeah, it's it's a it's a it's a situation by situation adaptation that you have to make to it. If somebody is just really being like if they're if they're messed up on substances or uh, just out in left field, all you can do is 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 quietly back away and leave and then and then contact uh, law enforcement. But generally, people just want to have their have their time to express their their thoughts and have a receptive ear. And then a follow up is key as well. Well, Tony, I'm curious if you can share with us possibly some common mistakes or misunderstandings that visitors have when it comes to river safety or regulations and how you might educate them and enforce rules without coming across overly strict or harsh. Yeah, we run into this quite a bit. Um, a lot of folks, I manage uh, rivers um, like section of the Rogue and Salmon, I believe, that are mixed use, both motorized and non-motorized. However, the commercial motorized sector of the industry is uh, still relatively early on um, compared to those other rivers that have a multi-decade tenure. Um, and so a lot of folks come to my sections of the Colorado River or the Green. Um, there is no commercial, it's just private motorized use on the Green. Um, and don't anticipate seeing um, upstream travel. And that's a really quite difficult uh, thing to manage because most um, non-powered river recreation doesn't know about the Coast Guard's inland nav rules. So there's an entire rule book out there that doesn't apply, that applies that people have never really had to consider. And so you need to introduce this idea of, um, you know, draft restriction and weightless speed and speed and procs and moving to the left. And we've got a, a, a blob of multicolor inflatables heading downstream and they don't move over. It, it can make things difficult. And we're trying very hard to get that messaging out um, really before people get on the water because there's not, we can't be everywhere all at once but we can find that inflection point where we can meet the most people at the same time. And so, you know, we also don't do um, a permit check-in. It's a free launch. So uh, particularly during holiday weekends, like this weekend, we're all out in force, just tabling boat ramps and doing check-ins, trying to just keep the net as tight as possible. And we explain to people, I, you know, um, I think they teach this, in LNT courses about the authority of the resource. Um, you know, I, I give people the benefit of the doubt for the sake of their intelligence and get technical about, you know, why that motorboat couldn't just stop for them and turn around because the river is shallow and the boat would crash. And if you give people the benefit of the doubt for the sake of their intelligence and really explain it, that they get it. 90% of the time they're like, oh yeah, that make that makes sense. I should move over next time. Yes, thank you. Um, you know, I I like to in earnest not cater to the lowest common denominator. Explain things. Do you what are some ways that you help educate people yet enforce rules and try not to come across as too harsh or strict? Mm -hmm. Um, yeah, Tony mentioned it, but authority of the resource is, I'll second that, it's my go-to way to approach talking to people when educating them. Um, we also, the Three Forks Low Flathead River up here in Northwest Montana is also not permitted, um, so we have a whole slew of access sites um, along both the North and Middle Forks Low Flathead, so people are hopping on for day trips, they're hopping on for overnights, um, just, you know, whenever they want, so we don't get a chance to really sit, like, get that initial interaction before they get on the water. Um, so when we do run into people on the water and are making those public contacts, um, yeah, always trying to speak from um, a 
a spot of focusing on the river because that's a common ground that people, you know, everyone's out there because they want to be there and they all really care about this resource um, rather than speaking from like the badge um, and from the forest service. I try and speak from the river and focus on people's like the implications of people's actions. Um, we are up here in grizzly bear country. So proper bear food storage is really big. Um, and usually people are pretty good about it, but you know, we're getting a lot more visitors from out of state, um, out of the area that aren't familiar with traveling and camping in um, grizzly bear country. And so, you know, focusing on the implications of what happens when you don't properly store your food um, and a bear comes by and what's going to happen after um, that gets people. Cause then they're like, Tony said, they're like, Oh, I just didn't know. Now I know. And like, yeah, that makes a lot of sense. Um, sometimes like depending on who it is, um, trying to kind of guilt trip people a little bit, you know, without being like sarcastic or, um, just like done with talking with them because this is the fifth time we've had to talk about bear food storage that day. Um, that can also get people to kind of, you know, you're not, you're not being strict with them. You're not being really harsh. You're just being like, Hey, if you keep doing this, like something bad's going to happen. Um, the bears are easy for me up here because I've, um, had, we've had lots of, lots of problems with bears. Um, and uh, a couple of years ago, there was a mom and I want to say two cubs that had to be put down um, because they kept repeatedly getting into improperly stored food. And so I'll always, you know, kind of mention, oh, well, you know, last like last year we had to, you know, Fish, Wildlife and Parks had to put down this mom and two cubs, which is like super sad. And like, I don't want to be a part of having like the reason that a bear gets euthanized. And like, I'm sure you don't want to be the reason that a bear gets euthanized so like let's put our food in your truck because it's really easy um and that kind of like pulls at people's heartstrings and can get them to realize the why behind some of our rules and regulations um and then i think chad mentioned it earlier with dealing with tense situations but always just starting off with like a nice comment a little bit of humor like find some common ground when you're initially talking to people even if it's just like how bad the wildfire smoke is right now or how hot it is. Um, just getting that common ground can go a long way in making people um, see you as a person and not see you as just like the river ranger who's here to tell you not to do things. Though not grizzly country, but I know that the black bears can be a nuisance on the rogue. I'm curious if you have anything to add to that or even just um helping well, getting people to follow rules <laughs> yeah it's it usually kind of takes care of itself when somebody gets their um cooler ripped up or their dry box torn into they they start to believe us and use the uh the electric fence that we have at several campsites on the river but i'm hopefully going to be able to get my whole crew up and visit echo and see if we can learn something about uh, what they do where the bears eat you. Uh, we just have black bears and they haven't uh, they haven't presented any uh, any dangerous, really dangerous situations yet. But we have had had to have them euthanized and it's kind of crude, but it's true. A, a fed bear is a dead bear. Um, we explained to them that they do not relocate bears because then they're just somebody else's problem. Once they're habituated to human food, they are basically doomed. Um, and the bears on our river are not huntable. They were considered to be an outstandingly remarkable value at the time of, uh, of, river, of the inception of the Wild and Scenic River Act. So they are protected. So we have, uh, we have a, a constant dance that we do to, uh, to, to ensure the bears stay safe and the people do as well. Um, yeah, it doesn't always work, but it seems to be a happy stasis right now anyway. dance. Um, yeah. Well, I want to go back a little. Tony was mentioning a little bit about not having a river where people have to have like a permit. Um, but on the alternative, 
Chad, I know to go down the San Juan, you have to have a permit. So I'm curious if you can share with us some of uh, the river check-in procedures or process that you've come up with to help save time, minimize effort or errors. Um, yeah, and share a little bit about some tricks that you've got going on up on the San Juan. Sure. Yeah, happy to. So yeah, advanced permits are required for the San Juan, so recreation.gov. Um, and we have, of course, launch limitations each day by both number of people and also number of launches. So kind of two different thresholds. Uh, we do things, I think, a little different. I haven't talked to anybody else that's doing it this way, but um, during COVID, we started doing phone check-ins. So, of course, we've got people's information before they show up. So about a week out, in fact, that's what I'm doing today. Otherwise, um, we give folks a call. So it's just the trip leader, the, per well, the permit holder, which is usually the trip leader, um, and uh, kind of go through, you know, we have a more or less a spiel. I try to make it sound fresh and exciting every time and not too spiel-like, but uh, I want to make sure that I'm at least hitting the, the, the important things. Um, I love it. And I'm not a huge fan of talking on the phone in general. Like, it's not something I enjoy doing. Um, but for some reason, it's really nice to connect with people. Sometimes these conversations are five minutes. Sometimes they're 45 minutes. And it's just a way more relaxed environment than the ramp, which can often be stressful, not only for boaters, but also for us rangers, too. Um, and, you know, it can just be easy to get buttons pressed and, oh, there's somebody back in a trailer and they're about to hit us and all those things. All those stressors don't really exist as much. Um, and so it's an opportunity to, again, make sure everybody's um, prepared. Um, in some cases, I'm certainly doing some trip planning, which I'm happy to do, um, you know, like like as I'm talking to people today, I just got off yesterday. And so, you know, we have high water here at the moment and there's special things that are happening with that high water that people need to be aware of. Um, and this was touched on earlier, but like that I'm a huge fan of um, people having accurate expectations, even if the news I'm sharing with them isn't great. Like the camp you want to stay at is going to be underwater. Um, they still have a better trip and a safer trip and all, all that around just because they, they have a, a pretty clear uh, conception and they're not surprised when they get there. Um, and so anyways, as far as making consistent, like we definitely, I try to make it very conversational, but I've got a little cheat sheet that I just kind of, a, you know, look at every now and again to make sure I've um, covered the important things, but I, I do try to like, just kind of let it flow. And again, listen, um, and, and, and of course, uh, give people an opportunity for basically let that thing go as long as they want. So it's efficient in some ways, maybe not as efficient as you could make it. If you're just like, I need to do a check-in in five minutes, but the efficiencies that we get out of are a little different. It allows us to spend a lot more time on the river doing patrols because we were not just at the ramps waiting for people to arrive whenever they might. Um, and you know, we're kind of the way we're assessing on whether or not this works is whatever we're seeing on the ground. So if all of a sudden we're seeing impacts like people not being responsible for fires or that sort of thing, or lots of people not wearing the PFDs, then maybe that's a clue to us that we need to change our system. But so far, it seems to be working quite well because we're just not seeing those, you know, people making bad choices and not kind of following the rules. Um, and I, I don't know, it's just when I'm on a patrol and I've already talked to somebody, and we've like connected at least in a basic sense. Um, and they like, oh, and we can kind of continue a conversation as opposed to sometimes the awkward, like, hello, this is who I am. This is who you are. And this is why I'm stopping at your camp. Um, it's just smooth and a lot, a lot more friendly. Um, and so we're talking to people on the phone. If I'm at the ramp, I'll certainly come down and, and take, you know, uh, just kind of take a tour through and say hello to folks. Um, and again, just kind of continue the conversation. Um, and then again, the most, the best contacts that I have are on the river, right? When people are in camp and they're having a great time, they're sitting in their chairs or drinking a beverage. And, you know, again, we can just kind of keep chatting. How's things going? Oh, thank you for that information, all that kind of stuff. Um, so I don't know, it's, uh, it might not be for every program, but for us, it works really well. There's definitely some trust involved that, you know, people are saying they're bringing their groover. So we're like, you know, we're, we're taking that with some trust. But again, if all of a sudden we discovered that people weren't, weren't in fact bringing their groovers, then we would change our system. These check-in procedures, it gives you a little bit more time to get on the, the river and get out there to do some patrolling. Do you yep. have any best practices for conducting some thorough and accurate patrol reports? For sure. So um, I, 
I like to just do it on the spot. So if I encounter something, I stop. Well, I, you know, whatever the situation is, I continue to float in my boat or I pull out my eddy out. And anyways, I use my phone. Um, so I use Google Docs. And so I just have a doc that I've created for that particular report and I insert photos and all that kind of stuff. So for me, you know, I'm pretty succinct when I'm writing things down. Um, and that in some cases is enough to capture whatever it was that I witnessed or observed. Um, but other times it's just my kind of uh, cue when I get back to the office or whatever, when I'm kind of completing that report, maybe I expand on that, but it captures kind of the, the kernel of, of, you know, what I need to capture. And there might need more detail that I need, need to add later. Um, I think photos are great. I take lots of photos uh, because oftentimes that's a reminder to me of something that I saw that maybe I didn't jot down, but also it's just obviously that captures what I, what I saw. Right. And so I, I use my phone a lot and I include that stuff in the report. I include photos in the reports. Um, and I think, you know, for office staff, that's the main kind of, so we're using them internally. Um, we don't, we're not set up. I'd like to be able to kind of convey like snippets of those reports to the public. Um, I feel like we're mostly capturing that through our phone check-ins and then just running into people and sharing stuff. Um, but for the most part, it's a really good way to kind of keep office staff, especially like folks that work, like there's a river phone at the Monticello field office. Um, so that's the person that actually deals with the recreation.gov questions and, 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 you know, there's a point of contact there. So it's important that that person, even though they're not a river ranger doing patrols, has a pretty accurate um, concept of what's happening on the river. And so that's a good way for us to communicate that information. Yes. Do you have any other best practices for conducting thorough and accurate patrol reports? Sure. Yeah. All of all of our river rangers, um, more or less, we call it self-reporting their patrols. Um, I don't have a standardized form, and I really try not to micromanage too much how the reporting gets done. But we do have, like Chad said, we have a master Google spreadsheet that can be downloaded for offline use. And when we go out, we're tracking um, high level, um, very coarse data. This is the kind of stuff that we put out through social media and to politicians and just like letting folks know what we're doing in the big picture, like the number of restoration sites we visited or the pounds of trash collected or just the coarse aggregate number of visitor contacts we made in a week. Um, and then there's a different kind of reporting that's like the reporting for my chief or administration. And those are much more detailed. Like we're seeing these problems here at this site, or we think if we take such and such an action, if we remove some invasive plants here, it'll improve habitat this way. And so that's the, the free form part of it. And we generally, um, you know, uh, employee performance is oftentimes more determined by the quality and the resolution of those kinds of detailed notes. That's what I'm looking for. And that's how I train my folks is like, you know, journal like Edward Abbey out there, write down everything that you see. I want long form narrative descriptions of your troll reports. I will read them. I think they're interesting. Um, and so we kind of gather both things. And depending on who my audience is, when I have to go dress up like this and talk to whoever, I'm explaining like coarse aggregate whole numbers. And that is like the value added to the resource by my team's existence. Please don't cut my budget, right? And then there's the like how much more we could do if we were better resourced. And that's the stuff I'm talking with region chief or the forest supervisor, district manager, whatever agency you're calling it. So I've got two kinds of trees of reporting, depending on who I'm talking to. Yeah. Thanks, Tony. So I've got one last question I'm gonna ask um, Patrick and then Echo, and just wanna encourage everyone else to be thinking of any questions that you might have, cause we'll have a little bit of extra time here. I've seen a couple in the chat, but just prompting you to get ready. But um, Patrick, I'm curious, what resources or support do you need to perform your duties effectively? And how can you work with other agencies or stakeholders to maximize the impact of your work? Yeah, both um, officers I worked on have shared the, 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 uh, the resource uh, with, with different agencies. 
Um, well, to start with, the engagement of the rec planner responsible for the resource is essential uh, for effective direction and data collection and, and resource management. Um, other primary duties like safety, public interaction, and commercial use and monitoring can be accomplished just as a matter of course of river rangering. But to get the to get the direction so people aren't just doing busy work, uh, it's important to have a good dialogue with the person who is the uh, the guardian of the repository of the history of the river to make sure that you're not flying blind or re reinventing the wheel. Um, and then also having good relationships with the um, other other agencies um, is, is crucial. Uh, I work with the, my counterpart down on the lower Rogue River now. And one of the reasons that we do like to do a, a trip, well, we, we definitely do a, a trip uh, plan before the trip. And then, and then afterwards we do a trip report. We share that with the downstream, um, our counterparts down there. So they kind of know what's going on on the river. Um, so communication is, uh, is key and then working under the umbrella of the comprehensive river management plan, it, it's really important to our program on the rogue. Um, yeah, when, and then on another rivers I work with, we work with other agencies, you know, state parks was a big one on the Deschutes and Confederated Tribe of Warm Springs, city, county, state. Um, it's, it's a, it's a collaborative effort to manage a river and uh, the rivers I've worked on anyway. So having communication open is, is key. And when, uh, when, it's, when it's not open, people make assumptions about things and it can go off the rails. So it's very key to have information shared uh, with, with your partners and with your, with your staff uh, throughout the building, up the chain of management and, um, and down to the, to the level that, that we are out of the river. As well, like what resources or support do you need to perform your duties? And then how can you work with other agencies and stakeholders to maximize your impact? Yeah, I think I agree with everything that um, Patrick said and um, other part that's like important for me and being able to do my work. Um, it's just forming good relationships with the people that I work with. Um, so not only with my supervisor, with, um, you know, the other people in my office, our law enforcement folks, making sure that I know who they are, they know who I am. Um, so then when something does happen, um, you know, they're like, oh, yeah, I know who Echo is and what she's doing and um, what she's going to need. Um, and then also forming good relationships with um like my crew, the people that I'm out in the field with daily um, and supervising and directing and making sure that, you know, doing our best so that we all get along and, um, you know, we're a good performing group, um, trying to form those relationships outside of just supervisor to employee or crew member to crew member, um, but getting to know them. And um i am big on like having people who i can bounce ideas off of or get a second opinion from um in you know in my space so trying to form form that from the beginning um and not making it so much as a i know everything and i'm making the plans and this is what we're going to do and um if you have another idea like i don't want to hear it um but making it more of a like here's what i know here's what we're going to do. You know, if you have an idea about how to go about this differently, or maybe something doesn't make sense and you're like, why are we doing this echo? Um, like making that space to, um, have people feel comfortable to ask questions, bounce ideas off of. Um, and then of course there's always the situations where it's like, no, I said, we're doing this and we're just doing this because that's what needs to get done. Um, but knowing those, um, I think are two two big things that help me do my duties really effectively and um, just help out with having a good time at work. Um, yeah, and then the second part of that question, working with other agencies or stakeholders, um, we have a really neat relationship up here on the Three Forks of the Flathead. Um, it's a wild and scenic river that's jointly managed um, between the Forest Service, um, and then also Glacier National Park, um, and it forms the boundary of Flathead National Forest and Glacier National Park. So we've got a lot of mixed use going on, like two very different federal agencies with very different rules and regulations, um, but 
they have a river ranger program as well. And so at the start of the season, I was trying, you know, introduce myself to them, make sure we know each other. Um, we try and train together at the beginning of the year, go through um, our like on the water training, just get to know each other. Um, and then also share information throughout the season and make sure we have that open line of communication to where if they're out on the water seeing something, you know, on the forest side, they can communicate that with me. And then if I'm seeing, you know, me and my crew are out there seeing things that are happening on, um, you know, the park side or just things that are going on that um, I can share that with them and that we yeah have that open line of communication. Um, and we also try to coordinate being on different stretches of river on different weekends. Um, we'll, we'll bounce around the North and Middle Fork. So, you know, if we, the Forest Service, are over on the Middle Fork one weekend, like trying to get um, the park to be on the North Fork that weekend, just so we can be in more spots at once and um, just reach more people and have a better idea of what's going on. Um, and then we also work with a non, a pretty new nonprofit up here called Flathead Rivers Alliance. Um, we were working with them pretty closely. They're, uh, three years old, I think this year. Um, but they have a cool program called, uh, River Ambassador Program where they're enlisting, um, members or people from the community who care about the river, care about the flathead, um, want to get more involved and training them and then having them, uh, sign up for shifts to go be at boat ramps. Um, at some of the more popular access sites throughout the summer um, and just be another resource for people to talk to. They have information, you know, not only on Forest Service rules and regs, um, just information on wild and scenic rivers, uh, information on fish, wildlife and parks and like fishing rules and regulations up here, um, park regulations. They have like a whole slew of pamphlets and stickers and um, neat things. And so it's been really neat to work with them um, just to not only increase our reach of talking with people and getting that information out there, but also just having folks who are coming at it from a different perspective. Like they're not working for an agency. They're not out here to enforce um, rules. They're just here to talk with people because they really love the river system um, and like they're passionate about it. And that's what they're there for. Uh, so, yeah, working with both the nonprofit and the park to really just help protect the three forks of the flathead more has been neat. I'm going to echo what, or echo said, sorry, that wasn't an intentional <laughs> part, um, about the outdoor ambassador program. We have a relatively new type of local county program here where I work. And um, they're really quite a force multiplier, particularly on holiday weekends. Call them up, say like, hey, do you have anybody who wants to be able to come to a boat ramp with a couple of my rangers? And maybe we can check out two groups as fast as we would normally be able to do one. They're a great force multiplier. And if your local community has outdoor ambassadors, have a good relationship with them. They're useful. question that they'd like to ask. If so, you can raise your hand and I can call on you. Um, I did see Adrian asked about like, how does one become a river ranger and what advice do you have to share? And I saw some great comments put into the chat about um, usajobs.gov and also going boating. Curious if anyone has anything else to add like one piece of advice for a beginning river ranger. Yeah, go ahead, Chad. Sorry, I didn't use the digital hand. I used the hand hand. <laughs> um, way back, so I worked as a Westwater uh, Canyon uh, river ranger in the early 2000s, and I got in by volunteering. So I was working at a, at a state park, a Dead Horse Point State Park near Moab. On my days off, I'd go uh, help them out, and that that's how I got in. Um, and it also was kind of a transition or a, a process for me to understand what that job involved and if that was something I was going to be good at and was, you know, I'd find rewarding. So that's, you know, there's often opportunities on the San Juan, for example, 
um, you know, we're always open to, to, to a, a volunteer um, opportunity that somebody might have in mind. So we don't have a concrete program necessarily, but like if people kind of have something in mind that, where they think they might be able to help, we're certainly open to that and we try to do our best to make it happen. Yeah, as like we kind of started the discussion today, it seems like, you know, River Rangers wear a lot of hats. They're often doing a lot of trying to accomplish a lot with limited resources. So a good way of getting in is like finding out where you can help out um, and, and help them accomplish more. Risa, you yep. have a question? You know, wearing um, multiple hats, are how many of you, are any of you all also law enforcement? I kind of forget how, no, no one's law enforcement. Sometimes kind of. there are some rangers who are, so I, yeah, just was curious. Yeah, I, I'm i partially law enforcement. The Forest Service has a program, the Forest Protection Officer, um, which is not a full law enforcement position, but they we are able to write tickets um, like citations and warnings and incident reports for low level violations. Um, so things like not storing your food properly or um, overstaying camp limits. Um, so like a real low level law enforcement. Yeah, thank you. Just your, thank you. Adrian's question about like a uh, beginning river ranger. Lee had asked at the beginning, what advice do you have as someone who might be like starting a river ranger program? Go ahead, Tony. I really like that question, Lee. Um, I am the first person who's had my job who's had seasonal staff to help them out. Hmm. Um, I would say um, taking excellent notes and documenting the work you're able to accomplish compared to the work that you see that needs done and being a squeaky wheel and being a self-advocate for your program is necessary. Um, if it's uh, a lot of people like, I don't want to complain too much. I like my job. I don't want to lose my job. Well, if you're not going to get the resources you need to do your job, well, you might not be at the right spot. So be a squeaky wheel. Um, you're not advocating for yourself. You're advocating for your river. Um, and the second thing, you mentioned a River Ranger program with partners. Um, I would direct you, they're not here, obviously, but to the Trace Rios BLM field office in southwestern Colorado. They manage the Dolores River. And this year, the, the Dolores only flows every six years or so um, for ecological reasons. Um, they have a River Ranger and they only fly that job when they need to, when there's going to be water there. And they take care of the finance in conjunction with a uh, friends of type organization. And so they have this River Ranger program in Trace Rios field office that only exists when they need it to. It's a really interesting concept. So I would send you their way um, and I can talk to Angie and maybe dig up their contact info, but they might be the people who could give you the best advice. I have a couple minutes left. Um, so as we're nearing the end of our session on the art of being a river ranger, I just want to express my gratitude to all of our panelists for offering their unique perspectives and their wealth of knowledge. And to all of our attendees, whether you're a seasoned river ranger or someone aspiring to join this profession, I hope you found today's discussion informative and inspiring. 